Hello and welcome back. My name is Liz. In this lecture we will discuss how to select an even sampling depth for use in alpha and beta diversity metrics. As we begin performing more analyses of the samples in our feature table, an important parameter that needs to be defined is the even sampling depth, also known as the rarefaction depth, that diversity metrics need to be computed at. Because most diversity metrics are sensitive to different sampling depths across different samples, it is common to randomly subsample the counts from each sample to a specific value. For example, if you define your sampling depth as, say, 500 sequences per sample, the counts in each sample will be subsampled without replacement so that each sample in the resulting table has a total count of 500. If the total count for any samples are smaller than this value, those samples will be dropped from the downstream analysis. It can be helpful to make your choice on this even sampling depth by reviewing the information that you'll find in your given feature table summary file. Um, ideally, you'll choose a value that is as high as possible um, so that you can retain more sequences per sample while excluding as few samples as possible. Alrighty, so before we get started, as a brief overview, in this tutorial we will generate a feature table summary, inspect this using Chime 2 View, which will help us pick an even sampling depth. From there we will generate alpha and beta rarefaction plots and examine these in Chime 2 View as well to see if our diversity metrics appear to have stabilized with our chosen sampling depth. All right, so let's jump right in. I am going to start off by um, pulling up the tutorial and coming down to the downstream tutorial segment here. And I'm going to select identifying an even sampling depth for use in diversity metrics. Again, um, as we've mentioned in previous segments of the tutorial, we're going to be doing all of this in Q2 Galaxy, so make sure you have your interface selector um, set to Galaxy. So I'll go ahead and left click on that from the drop down. <coughs> so I'm going to go ahead and scroll down here um, to our uh, first set of instructions. Um, so we're going to start off by generating a feature table summary. Um, and so this is just going to be that summary of our most recent feature table that we created. Um, and as a reminder, that is going to be our filtered-table-4.qza that we generated under taxonomic annotation. Um, so I am going to go ahead and pull up Galaxy. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we are going to be using this filtered table 4.qza for our feature table summary and we will also be using our same sample metadata.tsv file that we've been using throughout this entire tutorial. Okay, so I'm going to start by scrolling down here to Chime 2 feature table. I'm going to go ahead and click on this and from the list of subcommands, I am going to scroll down until I see Chime 2 Feature Table Summarize. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And so the first thing that we need to add um, for our table, um, which is going to be our feature table of type frequency, relative frequency, or presence absence, is going to be our filtered table 4.qza. If you don't see that auto filled here, um, you can go ahead and click on this little drop down and select it from here. Next, we need to add our metadata file. So I'm going to go ahead and click here for additional options. And then I want to select insert sample metadata. And from here, our sample metadata should be metadata from TSV. So if you don't see that auto populated here, go ahead and click and select this from the drop down. 
and then for our metadata source, again, if we don't see our sample metadata.tsv file auto-populated, you can go ahead and click and select that from the dropdown. Okay, so we are ready to go ahead and click Execute. So this is running this Chime feature table summarize. Um, so we can now see this progress bar. So that command is actually running. We'll wait for this to turn green um, to make sure that this is completed successfully. Perfect. So now we can see this Chime 2 feature table summarize on data 3 and data 1, visualization.qzb. So again, I want to rename this um, as something that's going to be helpful for me to come back to later. So I'm going to go ahead and do just like we've done before. I'm going to select the pencil icon for editing those attributes. I am going to click three times under the name box to highlight everything and go ahead and delete all of that. And I am going to title this filtered dash table dash four SUMM and that is a .qzv file. So this is just going to be our filtered table for summary. Um, okay, so I am going to go ahead and click save. And now we are ready to view this feature table summary in Chime 2 view. So I'm going to go ahead and click on our filter table for summary and scroll down and go ahead and left click here, view at Chime 2 view. Alrighty, so we are now looking at a summary of the feature table that was generated from Data 2. Um, so a reminder that this is the full data set um, that we're working with here versus the subset that we actually denoised together earlier in the workshop. So I want to take a look at first this table summary. Um, so we can see this um, three rows here that's going to tell us um, a little bit about our feature table. Um, so the first row that we're looking at here is this number of samples. Um, and so we can see that number over here as 356. Um, so that's going to be the number of samples in our data set. The next row that we see down here is the number of features. Um, so we see this number is going to be a little bit higher. Um, and so this is uh, 2,416. Um, so what this represents is the number of unique features present. Um, features being a generic term for number of things essentially stored in our data set. Um, so these features can represent um, amplicon sequence variants, uh, OTUs, metabolites, etc. Um, so this is just the number of unique items, features, etc. Um, in our um, 356 samples. And so what we're seeing down here in this third row, um, that total frequency, um, which we see is a much larger number, um, 22,683,495. Um, this is the total number of times all features, um, so all of these unique features, um, were observed across all samples. So this isn't looking at unique features, this is looking at any feature, however many times it was observed across all of our samples. Okay, so we're not going to spend too much time um, on the rest of this page. Um, what we're looking at here is different frequency distributions. So we can see we have our frequency per feature as well as frequency per sample. Um, so on your own, if you'd like to take some time and look at these, you're welcome to. Um, that's not something we're going to spend a lot of time in the tutorial on. Um, where I actually want to navigate to next 
um, and take a closer look is going to be the interactive sample detail tab. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. Okay, so what we are looking at here in the interactive sample detail tab is going to be how many samples pre are present in each metadata group um, for a given metadata category. Um, so what we're looking at right now is the day relative to FMT um, against the number of samples. So we're seeing different number of samples for each different day relative to FMT. Um, so if I go over to the metadata category drop down here um, and I click on this, I can see all of these different metadata categories. And so this is kind of a good time to just talk about how helpful it is to have informative metadata um, or detailed metadata that has, you know, accurate column labels um, to describe your data set and information that you want to utilize in your downstream analyses. Um, so, you know, we can see access, accession, bioproject, HCT source, disease. Um, so we have all of these different groups. And what I actually want to look at is the auto FMT group. So if I click on that, I can now see um, I see a lot less um, here than I was looking at before because um, I am only looking at now two different groups um, in this specific metadata category. So I'm looking at the control group versus the treatment group um, and the relative number of samples in these two groups. So if I hover over this, I can see that there are 150 samples in the control group and there are 206 samples in the treatment group. Um, so if I scroll down here as well, um, this kind of gives me a more detailed overview. Um, so I can look at these individual samples um, and their associated feature count. Um, and this is just telling me the total number of observed features in each sample. Um, so we can see, for example, sample ID FMT.0103D had a total feature count of 700,856. Um, so we'll see these varying numbers throughout the entire table. Um, so the next thing we want to take a look at is the sampling depth. Um, so I can see this little um, this little scroll bar here. And if I click on this, um, I can see how things are changing back and forth. Um, so take a minute here to kind of play around with play around with this and see how things change um, with our um, differing sampling depths. Um, so kind of to go back to um, what I discussed at the beginning of the video, when you're performing even sampling on a feature table, the first step is going to be to filter out samples with a feature count lower than the sampling depth. Um, and the reason for that is because you can't randomly subsample from a sample with less than the selected number of features. Um, so if we stop here, for example, we can see we have this sampling depth of 35,410. Um, and so we can see underneath that retained 6,550,850 features or 8.88% per, of features in 185 samples or 51.97% of samples at the specified sampling depth. Um, so if I continue um, and I choose a larger sampling depth here, um, I'm going to do this for visualization purposes. Um, so we're retaining two samples this time around. If I scroll down to the actual table here, I can see all of the samples highlighted in red. Um, down here, these are all of the ones 
that have actually been removed um, because they have this lower feature count. Um, so if we're looking at a sampling depth of 59,000 or 597,201, we can see all these other samples. Um, so for example, this sample had um, 403,000 features, so it was removed. So we only have these two um, samples that were retained. Um, and so vice versa, if we pick a much more shallow sampling depth, um, we can see that we've retained um, a lot more samples, um, but we actually look and we see that we've only retained 10% of the features. Um, and so the question here is how to pick a good, you know, how to pick the appropriate even sampling depth. Um, and unfortunately, there's no easy answer. Um, this really depends on what your study entails. Um, so some questions you should ask yourself. Um, what does your study depend on? What are you trying to test? Because um, there are going to be a lot of trade-offs of retaining more features versus more samples. Um, so again, we can see that if we have this really shallow sampling depth, we're retaining most of our samples, um, but we're not seeing as many of those features. Um, and as we kind of move up in our sampling depth, we are retaining more features, but we're losing more of our samples. Um, what we are gonna be aiming for in this um, tutorial is going to be picking a sampling depth, um, we want to pick a value that is as, as high as possible. Um, so we want to retain more sequences per sample while excluding as few samples as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and type in a sampling depth here. I'm going to type in 10,000. Um, so I am clicking on this little sampling depth box here and I am going to type in one zero 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 zero. And so what I can see here is that I am retaining 356 samples um, and 15% of my features. Um, and so this is going to be kind of a pretty good middle ground for us um, in retaining still a fairly decent percentage of our features um, and retaining all of our samples. So what we can do next to kind of corroborate or um, get additional evidence against or with um, our proposed even sampling depth is going to be our um, alpha and beta rarefaction plots. Um, so what we'll be looking for is um, we want to see if our um, associated diversity metrics appear to be pretty stabilized um, at the depth of coverage that we've chosen. Um, so in practice, um, we can iterate these diversity metrics over many different sampling depths rather than just one um, to kind of give us a better idea of what is going to be the most reasonable or the most ideal value for us to pick for our specific study. So something to keep in mind is that we haven't actually defined alpha and beta diversity yet, um, but we will. Um, so I'll be giving you some basic details in these upcoming sections to help explain enough to understand these rarefaction visualizations, but we will be diving in much deeper um, in subsequent videos for alpha and beta diversity metrics. So what we're going to do next is we are going to take a look at some diversity metrics. Um, and this is going to illustrate the impact of our chosen rarefaction depth or even sampling depth on various alpha and beta diversity measures. What we're going to do is we're going to start by looking at our um, alpha diversity metrics. Um, so we're going to do that by running chime diversity alpha rarefaction. Um, and so this command is going to give us an output visualization that's going to allow us to examine those alpha diversity metrics. Um, take a closer look and we'll talk about what that means for our chosen 
sampling depth. So I am back in the tutorial here. I've scrolled down to the alpha rarefaction plot section. So what I see first is that we are going to use the Chime 2 Diversity Alpha Rarefaction tool. Um, so I'm going to head back over into Galaxy. And from here, I am going to scroll down on this sidebar to Chime 2 Diversity. I'm going to click on Chime 2 Diversity to look at all of these subcommands. Scroll down until I hit Chime 2 Diversity Alpha Rarefaction. Go ahead and click on that and we will go through everything that we need to add before executing this. So to start, we're going to be adding our feature table of type frequency. Um, and for that, we're going to use that same filtered table 4.qza that we used to generate that feature table summary. So if you don't have that in here already, go ahead and select that from the dropdown. And next, um, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about this parameter. So this is going to be the max depth. Um, so for our alpha rarefaction, we want to set our max depth to around two to three times greater than the rarefaction depth or the even sampling depth that we've selected. Um, so with our sampling depth that we've chosen of around 10,000, I'm actually going to go ahead and type in 33,000. And so this is giving us plenty of coverage. Um, to make sure that we can examine and check for stability in alpha diversity at our chosen depth of 10,000. So from here, I'm going to actually go ahead and click on the click here for additional options. Um, so we have a couple more things we need to add. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip this phylogeny of type rooted. But from here, I actually want to click on this insert metrics. Um, and so this is going to be the metrics that we are actually measuring. Um, so the diversity metrics specifically. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click on this here, scroll down, and you'll see this selection required. Um, I'm going to click on this and this is going to give me a drop down. Um, for this tutorial, we're going to go ahead and use the Shannon diversity. So I'm going to scroll all the way down, click on Shannon. And again, in your own time, you can take a look at other diversity metrics. Um, as you can see here, we have a long list. We have Faith's diversity. Um, you know, we have uh, Genie Index, um, Simpson, Ace, Robbins, etc. cetera. Um, but for this tutorial, we're going to use the Shannon diversity. So I'm going to scroll down here. And then we're going to go ahead and insert our metadata file associated with that, um, that filtered table. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this. Um, same as we've done before, we want to utilize that metadata from TSB option. So clicking on this if that's not already what it's set to. And then from here, we should still see that sample-metadata.tsv file. Um, again, select that from the dropdown if that's not already added here. This is all that I need to modify here. Um, I did want to quickly discuss this last parameter, though. We are going to leave this number of iterations um, at 10. Um, but this is going to be the number of rarefied feature tables to compute at each of these steps or the number um, or the selected rarefaction depths um, to include between our minimum depth and our maximum depth. Um, so that max depth, as a reminder, is the 33,000 or that little over three times greater than our selected rarefaction depth. Um, we've left our minimum depth blank, so that's just going to go ahead and start at 1. Okay, so we are now ready to go ahead and execute this. So I am going to click on this execute button, and I can see that um, 
this job is now running, we have our little progress bar here. Um, so we'll wait for that to complete. And then we will, like we've done before, um, we're going to rename this output file um, to something that is going to be helpful for us to come back to later. So this could take a few minutes to actually compute. Um, so control room, if you want to go ahead and pause for just maybe 30 seconds or so to give folks some time um, to make sure that this has um, completed successfully, um, then we'll jump back in and keep moving forward. Okay, so I can see here now that this um, output has turned green. I can go ahead and click on this, see that I now have a Chime 2 visualization um, or a QZV file. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the pencil icon to edit the attributes and rename this. So I'm going to triple click on this to highlight everything under the name. I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And I'm going to title this Shannon Rarefaction Plot. And again, that is a QZV file. Um, great. So I will go ahead and click on Save here. And now we are ready to go ahead and take a look at this in Chime 2 View. So I'm going to scroll down here to that hyperlink um, view at Chime 2 View and go ahead and click on that. Okay, so let's jump right in here. Um, so we can see there's a lot going on in this plot. Um, so we'll take a few minutes here and discuss um, a few different things that we're looking at. Um, but as kind of a quick overview, um, these alpha rarefaction plots that we're going to be looking at are similar to our interactive sample detail. Um, not exactly the same, um, but essentially what we're doing here is we're looking at various alpha diversity metrics um, that are computed across a range of sequencing depths. And so as a reminder, um, before we jumped into this plot, we had selected that number of steps and number of iterations. Um, and so that is impacting what we're seeing here in this plot. Um, we are seeing these alpha diversity metrics calculated at 10 different sequencing depths. And at each sequencing depths, that is being calculated or rarefied 10 different times. Um, and so, of course, that would change um, if we had selected either different, uh, a different number of steps or a different number of iterations. So for these alpha diversity metrics, um, we're able to group these samples um, or these different samples alpha diversity values um, into different metadata groupings. Um, so what we're looking at here um, is various sample metadata columns. We're starting off by looking at this patient ID. Um, so we can see there's a lot going on here since we have so many different patient IDs. Um, what we're actually going to do is we're going to click on this drop down and we're going to select that auto FMT group um, and take a look at this just like we did in the interactive sample detail. Um, so we can see here now that we're only seeing two groups. Um, and so this corresponds to what we were looking at in the interactive sample detail of our um, feature table summary, that control group and that treatment group. Um, so that's the same as what we're looking at here. Um, so this other box that we're seeing or this drop down um, is going to be the specific alpha diversity metric that we're looking at. In this case, um, we selected Shannon um, as that diversity metric. So that's all that we're going to see here. Um, and so we're seeing that Shannon's diversity metric on the y-axis against the sequencing depth on the x-axis. Um, and so again, we're seeing this plot as representative of the number of steps um, that we chose um, 
back in our alpha rarefaction calculation. So we can see our first step is at 1, and then we have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and our tenth step is at that max depth of 33,000 um, that we had chosen. And that corresponds to, like we mentioned earlier, roughly three times greater than that even sampling depth we selected of 10,000. Um, so just to talk about the Shannon diversity metric a little bit further, um, this diversity metric takes into account a couple of different things. Um, it takes into account the number of different species that are living in a given habitat, um, also known as the richness, and it also takes into account their relative abundance in that habitat, um, also known as the evenness. Um, if we use an example of a pet store, um, we can think of the richness in a specific pet store to be the number of different animals that are present in that pet store. Um, and that's not counting all of the animals present. That's saying, say in a specific pet store, we have dogs, we have rabbits, we have fish. Um, and so there, those are going to be all of the different types of animals in that pet store. Um, and then if we're talking about their relative abundance um, or their evenness, that takes into account how many rabbits are in the pet store relative to the total number of animals in that pet store. How many dogs, how many fish, etc. Um, so that's what we're looking at on the y-axis, and then again that x-axis is going to be the sequencing depth. Um, so if I scroll down here, um, we are looking at a secondary plot, and this plot is actually going to be pretty much the same thing that we're looking at in that interactive sample detail as we scroll through our different sampling depth. Um, so we're starting at zero, and we can see that we have all 356 samples present. As I slowly scroll through this, we're losing all of these samples until coming all the way down to the end, we're only retaining one sample. So if I go back over um, to our alpha rarefaction plot, we can see that corresponds here. Um, so for our control and our treatment groups, as we're going from zero all the way down to that 33,000, that max depth that we chose, um, we can see that that number of samples goes all the way down as well. Okay, so I am going to scroll back up here and we'll talk a little bit about um, how we can determine whether or not we have chosen an appropriate uh, even sampling depth. So going back again to that number of 10,000, um, if we look at um, the uh, Shannon's diversity across different sampling depth, we can see that at around 10,000, we're hitting roughly the same metrics here. Um, so we can see this is a pretty flat line um, with a little bit of variation, but for the most part, it's staying relatively stable. Um, so we're looking at just under that value of three for our Shannon's diversity. Um, and so that's a good sign. Um, that tells me that I've chosen an appropriate um, even sampling depth. Um, so when choosing an even sampling depth, these plots are quite important to look at because if, for example, we chose a sequencing depth of, let's say, 1,000, um, so right around here um, in our sequencing depth in this plot. Um, we can look over and if we were to select this sequencing depth, we would have a vastly different um, alpha diversity or Shannon diversity than we would at the majority of sequencing depths here. And so that wouldn't be a 
good value to pick um, because that is not an accurate representation of our data. So as a second example, if we were to choose a sampling depth of say something like 30,000, so pretty close to that max depth that we chose when we were calculating these um, rarefaction plots, um, we'll see that these relative diversity metrics um, for these two samples are actually gonna be quite different than what we see for the rest of the plot. Um, so we're gonna see that treatment group has a lower Shannon's diversity than the control group. Um, and that's not what we're seeing in the rest of these sequencing depths. Um, so again, that's a reminder to really be mindful of this um, rarefaction depth that we're choosing to accurately represent our data. So based on that stability that we're seeing here in our alpha rarefaction plot, I'm feeling pretty good about the sequencing depth of 10,000 um, that we had chosen earlier on um, when we were looking at our uh, feature table summary. Um, so one last thing before we move on and take a look at our beta diversity metrics. If we scroll down here, um, we can actually go ahead and click some of these on and off. So if I'm looking at this bottom plot here, um, I can turn off the trend um, for our control and treatment groups. Um, and I'll actually go ahead and turn this off completely for the treatment. Um, and so if we look up here, we can see these box and whisker plots that are present for each of those 10 steps or those 10 different sampling depths um, that our alpha diversity metrics were calculated at. Um, so these box plots are going to represent the distribution of the selected alpha diversity metric. Um, so that's going to be the Shannon diversity. Um, what that value is at that particular sequencing depth. Um, so there's a distribution of these values because there are multiple samples within each group that we're looking at. Um, control versus treatment or any of these other metadata columns um, depending on how you want to visualize um, these diversity metrics. We can go ahead and click on this help text here um, and this is just going to give us more information about what we are actually looking at. Um, so again like we mentioned before this is that representation of our selected alpha diversity metric um, in this case uh, Shannon's diversity um, and then we can also see the lower and upper whiskers of that box plot are the ninth and 91st percentiles of the distribution. We have the upper and lower um, extents of the box or the 25th and 75th percentiles of the distribution. And then the horizontal bar through the middle of the box is that median value. Um, so again, take a look around on your own time here. Um, yeah, spend some time looking at the help text um, to get yourself more familiarized with um, this visualization and what we're actually looking at. Alrighty, so we are ready to move on to our beta diversity metrics. So let's go ahead and jump in there. Alrighty, so I have hopped back over to the tutorial and I have scrolled down from the alpha rarefaction plots section to the beta rarefaction plots. So what we are going to be doing is we are going to be utilizing the Chime2 Diversity Beta Rarefaction tool. So I am going to jump back over to Galaxy and scroll down to Chime2 Diversity. And once I've clicked on Chime2 Diversity, I again have these list this list of subcommands. So I'll scroll down to Chime2 Diversity Beta Rarefaction. Okay, so 
Again, we have a few things to modify here, so we'll start at the very top. Um, again, we need a feature table of type frequency, so we're going to utilize that same filtered table 4 that we've been using for this entire tutorial. Um, and then again, a reminder to go ahead and click on that filtered table 4 and select that from the dropdown if you're not seeing that already um, auto-filled here. Next, we are going to choose the beta diversity metric um, that we're going to compute. Um, so let's go ahead and type in BR. So now I see that Bray Curtis has come up. This is going to be the uh, beta diversity metric that we're going to take a look at here. Um, so just as a quick overview, um, Bray Curtis is a method for calculating the dissimilarity between different groups or sites in terms of the species or um, features found at those sites. Um, and so again, if we're going back to our two different groups in our auto FMT group, that's going to kind of give us more information um, about the dissimilarity between those two groups. Okay, so I am going to now scroll down to the clustering method um, and I am going to select NJ here. Um, and so that stands for neighbor joining. Um, and this is just a method, um, a clustering method um, that we are going to use in this analysis. So Next, I am going to need to add that same sample metadata that we have been working with in this uh, tutorial. So again, I am going to select metadata from TSV and then click on this drop down here and select that sample metadata.tsv file if that is not already autofilled again. Okay, and then here for the sampling depth, we are actually going to use that even sampling depth or the rarefaction depth um, that we chose um, in our original feature table summary. Um, so I am going to type in 10,000 here. So 10000. Zero, 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 zero. Okay, and from there, I'm all set, so I'm going to go ahead and click Execute and then wait for this to start running. So we see the progress bar going. Um, we'll wait for this to complete and then we'll go ahead and do what we've been doing um, earlier in the tutorial, which is again naming this something that will be helpful to come back on later. And so this is um, another calculation that may take a couple of minutes. So control room, um, if needed, maybe we can pause um, for 30 to 45 seconds to make sure that everyone is able to um, get this completed um, before we move on. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and click on the edit attributes um, pencil icon. And then I'm going to triple click in the name box here. Go ahead and delete that. Um, and I am going to rename this to Bray Curtis Rarefaction Plot dot QZ, QZV. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and click Save. Okay, and so one quick thing that I wanted to mention um, before we go ahead and examine this visualization is that we chose a sampling depth um, for this calculation at that target depth, um, that 10,000, um, because beta diversity is more computationally expensive than alpha diversity. Um, whereas alpha diversity, you know, we uh, computed that up to two to three times greater um, than our target depth. Um, but that's why we chose our actual uh, target depth for this analysis. 
Okay, so I am ready to go ahead and take a look at this in Chime 2 view. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the Bray Curtis Rare Faction plot um, .qzv. So again, this is a Chime 2 visualization. I'm going to scroll down here to the Chime 2 view hyperlink, and I'm going to click on that and wait for this to load. Okay, so what we're looking at first, um, so we have a few tabs here. We're gonna start off by looking at the PCOA plot. Um, and this stands for Principal Coordinate Analysis. Um, and so what we're looking at here, um, and I am going to actually zoom out a little bit and scroll down here. Um, this is showing the similarity or dissimilarity between samples. Um, and so before we talk about this a little bit further, I am going to kind of make things a little bit easier to look at. So we have a couple of uh, drop down menus here. Um, I'm going to start by clicking on the select a color category. And I'm going to select, um, just like we've been looking at in this entire tutorial, the auto FMT group. And so that's showing me the control and treatment samples again. I'm actually going to also click on the classic Chime Colors drop down. Um, this is going to give me different color scheme options. So I'm going to click on dark here just because I find this is a little bit easier to look at than those classic uh, Chime 2 colors. Um, so I'm scrolling down here a little bit. And so what we can see is the green um, circles are for the control group and the orange circles are for the treatment group. Um, so each of these, I originally called them circles, they're actually ellipses. Um, and the, these ellipses are showing the variance over 10 iterations in this calculation. Um, so what we're seeing here is these all look like very circular points. It's really hard to tell. Sorry, this is a little bit zoomed in. It's really hard to tell that we have uh, ellipses here at all. Um, but this is actually a good sign um, because this tells us that those 10 different calculations produced very similar results. Um, so again, this is supporting um, our original even sampling depth um, that we had chosen. This is another kind of piece of the puzzle that shows us that we've picked a reasonable value for this. Okay, so I am going to scroll up here and I'm gonna click on the heat map tab. So scrolling down here, um, what I see is this title up here, Bray Curtis Mantle Correlation Between Iterations. Um, so we can see that this heat map is based on this Spearman's row value. And so this is just essentially showing us how similar the results were between each of those 10 iterations. Um, so, <clears throat> We're actually seeing that all of these iterations, this, this kind of corresponds with those very circular ellipses we were looking at in our PCOA plot. Um, these are all very similar. Um, we're seeing a Spearman's row value of very close to one. Um, and again, this is also supporting evidence that we have chosen a reasonable value for our even sampling depth. Okay, so for the last segment in this tutorial, I thought it would be helpful if we took a look at, say, a sampling depth that we kind of already know is not going to be a reasonable value. Um, so something that is, say, a very shallow sampling depth, um, something like 100. Um, and we'll take a look at the beta diversity um, visualizations here to kind of see what a poor choice would look like. Um, since we have such high stability here, it's kind of hard for us to understand what that um, variance would look like. So we'll go ahead and do that. Um, 
So I'm going to jump back over to Galaxy um, and I'm going to just go ahead and refresh the page here. Um, so again, I'm going to scroll down to Chime 2 Diversity, click on that, and in the list of subcommands, I'm going to click on Chime 2 Diversity Beta Rarefaction. And again, all of this is going to be the same as um, our last uh, command that we ran, the Bray Curtis Rarefaction. Um, the only difference is going to be, again, that sampling depth. So I am going to make sure I click on the filter table 4 um, from this drop down, select that in our feature table of type frequency. Um, in the beta diversity metric drop down, I'm going to clip, click on this and start typing in Bray Curtis and click that selection here. Scrolling down a little further, I'm going to use neighbor joining or NJ as my clustering method. And then scrolling down to our metadata, um, we're going to make sure that we're selecting um, metadata from TSV. So clicking on this drop down and selecting that. And then ensuring that our metadata source is still that sample metadata.tsv file. So clicking on this drop down and selecting that if that has not been autofilled. Okay, and then here for our sampling depth, I'm going to type in 100 for 100. Okay. And I am ready to go ahead and click Execute here. And now that this has started running, I'm actually going to go ahead and just rename this while I'm waiting for this to complete. So I am going to triple click on this here. And I'm going to type in Bray Curtis rarefaction plot and 100.qzb so that I remember that this is the rarefaction plot where I've set my sampling depth to 100. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click save here. And that's perfect timing. Um, so this uh, command um, went ahead and completed. Um, so that analysis is complete. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click on the QZV file. Um, again, this Chime 2 visualization. Um, now I'm going to click on the Chime 2 view hyperlink. And so right off the bat, we can see these giant ellipses. Um, so it's very visible here that there was a lot of variance between those 10 iterations. Um, so this is going to be more like what you'll see. Um, and I'll just go ahead and move this around a little bit so you can see that in all three dimensions. Um, this is what you're going to see when you run into a um, sampling depth that you may have chosen, um, not realizing that this um, wasn't a completely accurate value for your data set. Um, so this is a helpful kind of gut check um, to see if the value you've picked um, has consistency across those 10 different iterations. So next, I'm going to scroll up and click on the heat map um, to take a look at what that is going to look like. So this isn't quite as obvious um, as the PCOA plot, but I have my previous heat map pulled up. And if I go back and forth between these two, you can actually see that that Spearman's row value is much lower here. Um, so we're probably, um, you know, closer to a value of 0.5 um, 
than we are in our um, original plot with that sampling depth of 10,000. All right, so with that, I think it's time for us to wrap up this segment of the tutorial. Next, we are going to be taking a closer look at computing diversity metrics and examining our alpha and beta diversity visualizations in greater detail. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.